All right. So who's your audience? Who are you presenting it to? Are you presenting it to architects? Are you presenting it to engineers? Are you presenting it to a marketing firm or to those subsidies within, within one of the firms? Um, knowing that allows you to tailor your portfolio to that specific clientele and to the job that you're applying to. Uh, you can have a great essay, but if you're submitting it in, in lieu of a painting, it's not going to do you a lot of good. So just because it's a portfolio doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be generic. Um, with that, therefore, you want to edit your content. Know who you're talking to. Know what they want to see. Know the type of job that you're applying to. Um, what we're going to look at also is what to do, what not to do. There are some certain things that will automatically get them to tune out as you're talking. There are some things that you can easily do to maximize your chances of success. Uh, and then we'll look at some photography and how you can go about creating a professional book. It's amazing the, the difference in professionalism and attitude that you receive based on the way you present your work. So knowing who your audience is is going to give you a huge leg up on how you go about presenting your work. There's this misconception that everybody just shows their best stuff and they call it a day and it's like, we know what we're supposed to show, but all of that is what we call intrinsic. You assume that everyone's going to understand it. If you're applying for a technical position, it's great that you have a lot of really beautiful renderings, but that's not what they're going to hire you for, and that's not what they're going to be interested in. Uh, inversely, if you are applying for a visualization position or if you're applying as an intern, showing work that you would do uh, in the later stages of your career is not going to help you out. So knowing what it is that they're actually hiring for is going to give you a huge leg up. Um, Along with that, the way you present the work, everything from the moment that you walk in to the quality of the images that you produce, it doesn't matter if it's an awesome portfolio or it's an awesome project. If the images that you use don't relay that information, if the content that you produce doesn't show it in a way that's provocative, in a way that tells your story, uh, ultimately you're selling your idea. You're not selling, your, um, you're not selling yourself in that way. So. Um, well, I guess we should talk about how the portfolio is reviewed. So I, I come from a music background, and so I'm big on this idea in music production that you have to have someone's attention within 15 seconds. If you start talking and you're like, well, first I had cereal, and then I was really interested in this idea that you're talking, you've lost them already. So you really want to hit kind of the, the beat almost right away and get them to understand what it is you're looking. If they are asking about a number of different projects, don't spend 45 minutes talking about the first project because by the time you actually get to the work that you wanted to show them, they're going to be already checked out. Um, agenda and pace, this can go in, in both ways. The book can be a great tool for setting an agenda. If you bring in a giant book, which I never recommend that you do, what ends up happening is they start thumbing through the book and they're not listening to you. Uh, and they're just kind of like looking through this thing, hunting for something that's important. Uh, you'll see that uh, what tends to happen is they'll pick the one project you didn't want to talk about. Uh, it's inevitable. So the two rules about that is don't put anything in there that you're not willing to defend, talk about, and be an expert on. And the second part of that is just put enough stuff to whet their appetite. It's not a design review. that You're not selling them on the actual product to get built. You're simply there to show them, hey, I offer these skills. Someone uh, take a chance on me and pay me to let me help you in the ways that I can. So to touch on those points, cover the basics. It is amazing how often people forget to put their names or their information, contact information. What is the project that we're looking at? You know, sometimes you'll just see a set of beautiful renderings in a book, and you're like, this is great, but I don't know what I'm looking at. I don't know why I'm looking at it. Also, uh, give attributions when you're doing this. So then competencies. My background is visualization. So I don't go in on a portfolio and put in a bunch of technical drawings that's going to give someone the impression that that is my expertise. In the same way, put the stuff that you know you're good at. Don't put anything in there that says like, well, I tried this and I wasn't really good and I've never really done it, but I'm a lot better now. Um, so you should hire me. Because what they're going to hear is this person doesn't know how to edit. This person doesn't understand that they're trying to sell themselves, what happens if we put them in front of a client? And he says, like, well, we didn't really have time to do this because we were out partying last night. So, but, you know, don't worry. We'll get it built. Um, this part, the tailoring your application is, is huge. Um, a portfolio is not a generic vehicle that sells everything you're doing. In the same way that, that you don't present any paper, you don't present when you... Uh, 
in studio, you don't just design whatever, that, whatever you feel like designing, and then it's like the prompt said that you were designing a homeless shelter, but you didn't really feel like it, so instead you designed a fire station. You don't, you don't get to do that. So look at what they're designing. Look at the work that they're doing. Look at the work, th the type of people that they're uh, looking for and understand the why. What is it that they're actually looking for? Then tailor your portfolio. It doesn't mean to redo the whole thing from scratch, but find the pieces that you know will speak to their language, will speak to their interests, and will sell yourself in a way that makes, it, um, makes you desirable to them. Put those projects first or even just take them out. So it wasn't uncommon to have different types of applications whether, or portfolios, whether you have a design portfolio. and, and ac For example, for most of us teaching, we have an academic portfolio. It's not the same thing as, a, as the work that we do in the field. It is specific when, when we're applying at positions at universities. They want to know, I mean, frankly, they want to know the type of work that you guys produce based on our teachings. So if Karen has designed high rises, that's great, but they're not really interested in that. They want to know, can she get you guys to design things in a very specific way? Um, consistency is, is big. Um, what do you guys think that means, to be consistent with your support and your cover letter? So to repeat to, for the audience online, it's to be consistent with with in your cover letter with the information that you're showing so they're incongruent or so they're congruent yeah it's if you're talking about one thing in your cover letter and then they look at the work and they see it's a different designer and the most often place that I see something like this good times all right see they like that the most common place that you'll see something like that is group projects where you will show let's say I don't know let's say uh, Matt and I did a project together and Matt is a a magician with renderings and images, and I have never tried it in my life before. And then I put our images in there, but I kind of forgot to put his name in there, or I said it was a group, but I didn't really say that. And then they look at it, and they're not really paying attention to me talking because I'm nervous and I'm freaking out, and they're thumbing through the 600-page book that I presented. And they're like, oh, okay, this guy can do the images for us. And now, my cover letter didn't really specify that I'm not the person who's doing it or I'm not saying what I am doing. My book is telling a different story. And now I've put myself in a position where I a, have to tell them, well, I didn't really do this or um, I'm not giving themselves or giving them an opportunity to, to understand what I'm about. So some uh, quick, this is by, uh, the, by Arc Daily. Some of these things and a lot of things with portfolios, depending on what your background is and who you're talking to, um, even on this list are some things that maybe I don't agree with, other people do. It's, it is, there's no hard set rules on what you should do as long as you get the, the position or you get the results that you want. The first one, standalone resumes. You guys know why, that's in, why you should never just send a resume? So most jobs in architecture will never ask you for your, for your GPA. Do you guys know why? It, what, is the G, what is the GPA? It's a... It's essentially a metric of the type of work that you've done. Well, we have that. It's called a portfolio. We can see in the portfolio the quality of the work that you're producing. So if you just send a resume, that's great, but everyone can have a beautiful resume, and by beautiful I mean like fancy stuff on it and, and all this content. I've done 100,000 different things. Um, but really what they're looking for is, is the graphic content that backs up what you're talking about. So if you just send a resume, you're going to go in a stack with 500 other people and you're never going to look at it. Where architects and designers are visual creatures. Um, presentation is just as important as the content. You can have the great, greatest stuff in the world, but if you bring in junky looking stuff, you're going to tune out. It's like a typo on a, on a resume. Or it's like coming in sloppy, sloppy and kind of like running in and you're late. It's like once you, they make that impression, they're done. So per portfolio should look beautiful. It should look polished. It should look professional. It should tell them that they can trust you. Um, uh, Probably my biggest pet peeve, you don't need a 700-page portfolio for your first year of architecture school and then a 1,200-page portfolio for the last three years. Uh, if you consider that most projects or most architects after 30 years of practice can fill a 200-page book, if you need 100 pages to talk about your, your last two studio projects, you're probably not doing a very good job of editing. They're not, it's, again, it's not a design critique. What they want to see is what are your skills, how are you going to help me make money? 
and can I offer you anything in return? That's all it is. So it's always about kind of wetting, your, wetting their appetite. Give them enough that they understand what you're about, but don't bore them with all the details. Um, some of these we've already talked about, choosing a project with the office profile. Uh, PDF, nobody wants a 700, page PD or 700 megabyte PDF. You shouldn't need to. Most firms, it says 15, but most firms these days will not accept something more than two or three megabytes. So it's always a balance. You can compress, the, you compress, compress these things endlessly, but at a certain point, you're going to lose the quality. So it makes much more sense to have lesser or less content compressed at a higher or at a lower ratio than to have a ton of content compressed at such a high ratio that it ends up being pixelated, rasterized, and kind of just destroyed. Um, Number seven is a little tricky. Make your CV page appealing. That does not mean adding a bunch of fluffy stuff to it. A bunch. Uh, Karen's thing, uh, she always tells us at, um, at midpoint, do not let anyone put a gradient on their background. So appealing means that it is legible and that it is clear and that you can understand what it is that you're supposed to get out of it. It is not about putting your photo on there, your, um, your amazing dexterity with typography and so forth. Uh, they're not hiring you for that. If they are, then this is a totally different ballgame. Um, same thing with eight. So we've talked about all these. Don't put stuff that doesn't sell yourself in the way that you want. All right. So what to include, what to, what to exclude. Again, if there's any one thing you guys take away from this, don't put anything in there that you don't feel 100% talking about as the only thing they're going to talk about. I, almost every job interview I've done, um, or I've been on as a... As a, as a uh, uh, what's it called, as the interviewee, the first project they always go to is the one I'm like, oh, God, all right, fine, all right, let's talk about it. Can we talk about the stuff that's like super sexy, awesome? No, no, all right, we'll talk. So um, that's not just project, that's also content. If you are not a very strong writer, don't put a ton of words in because they're going to focus on the fact that you can't write or you can't communicate uh, through, through words, and that's not a good thing. If you are very good at writing but some of your graphic output isn't as great as it should be, beef it up with words. So know what you're good at um, and don't put anything in that, that you don't feel comfortable about. So this is uh, a page from the thesis of my mentor when I was in grad school. So Bill Helm, who's an architect now, and his background was a commercial and award-winning photographer and advertising exec before he went to grad school, so it's kind of unfair. But this is a two-page spread, meaning so it's the two pages opened up in a book. Some of you guys have probably already seen this if you've taken 390. Um, on the left, we have what we call the hero shot, the main shot that shows the effect. Underneath it, you have a couple of sketches. On the right, it shows the process and a little bit of text. It's, I would call this a pretty minimalist design, but it actually hits a lot of different things. It shows that he can design through thinking or, and through making. So he's sketching out ideas. He's able to craft them expertly. And it's not just crafting the, the object, but it's also the way you represent the craft of it. It becomes a little meta in that you're looking at both how you made it as well as what you made. And they're all just as important to do. And so we're seeing making of shots. We're seeing the final shots. And notice th it's not necessarily about the object. His project is all about the effect of light. But he's treating these images it, with the grids and with the quality of the images. They might as well be products that you can buy at MoMA. This is another one of his projects. The white isn't there. It's just on the, the, the PowerPoint so you guys can see the edge of the page. So in this case, this is a project. It was a group project. Now, a couple things that to take away from this. One is you've got the zoomed in shots, you've got the overall shots, you've got the construction job shots, and they're all seen in a very professional way. You also got these little guys that everyone forgets about. Don't put photograph underneath a photograph in the same way. Don't put a render, the word render, as a caption or a label. That doesn't tell us anything. Instead, tell us, the viewer, what we're supposed to be getting out of this. Why did you include this shot? What am I looking at? He's got the text underneath it. Notice we're in the last one. The grid is pretty strong. The text falls in within. It's a 2-1, so it's a three-column grid. One, two, three. Notice he's got the text as a two-column. That's not to say that once you get a grid, you have to do it perfectly. On the right one, we see that the text doesn't quite line up with the image, and that's because he has a series of grids overlaid on it. If you are comfortable with different types of grids and comfortable with, um, with graphic design, by all means do it. If you're not 100% comfortable with it, Start with a simple, clean grid. It's going to make your life a lot easier, and you don't have to design every page or every spread like it's a work of art that's going to go inside of the Whitney. So this is 
Also one of our instru other instructors and one of my design partners, Dave Schrager, who has a mentality, the first page of his portfolio says, throw it on the wall and see what sticks. He is a producer. He just makes content nonstop. So for him, it's all about overload. It's showing that, that you can't stop him from making. It's not to say that there isn't a hierarchy in this, but within his booklet, he tries to super saturate the image, and he's comfortable in being able to talk about it. His background is also in advertising, so he understands that kind of the principles that go in this. Now, what's, what's interesting is when we did a test on a couple of these, so this is another one of his page. Notice the hero shot, where the hero shot might be a rendering or an image or a photograph. It can also be a drawing. The, the way I always think of the hero shot is what is the one kind of salient moment of a project? So it's the, the main image that take away from it. In this case, this is part of his, his uh, second uh, post-professional degree, uh, MR2, where he was researching composites. And um, what's interesting is even though he was actually physically engineering the composites in a lab, the image that he chose to use was not what he thought would be the kind of like the cool look what I'm making, but it's actually the, the generating geometry for a project like this. And if we break down the way it works, and sorry about some of the, there's a typography that happened in, in Illustrator when you bring in certain typefaces, it turns the spaces into this kind of like the little accent with the E. But notice that there, there's one typeface in the whole thing. So the whole thing is done in Helvetica New, or Nua, depending on how you say it. But then he's using different variants of the font. So bold, uh, different sizes, all caps, uh, sentence cap to create a different set of hierarchies. So we've got 11, 9 through 8. So that's in that one. This is Bill Helm. They never met each other. They're, you know, they work in different parts of the country. Same idea though, one typeface. Uh, and you can always find a typeface is by take someone else's portfolio if it's a PDF, bring it into Illustrator. Chances are that you'll be able to pull out the, the metadata that tells you what it is. So in this case, it's all Avenir uh, Light Standard. And again, 11 point. So depending on the size of the booklet, you there's going to be it's a pretty standard way of looking at these things. And then this one is um, a, this was a graduate student at SciArc who also had, you know, you tend to see that he had a two grid set up or three if you count into including center spread. Um, but same thing, center gothic. One typeface, you can create a lot of variants. There's a, um, Chris Doe is a, is a famous um, graphic designer, motion designer. He has a firm, The Blind, in LA. And he has this, this, he talks a lot about this first project in design school. Uh, he had to do 400 layouts using one typeface. And they had to just lay it out in 400 different ways in this first studio in, in design school. And what it taught him is that you don't need to incorporate 5,000 different things. You can take the one thing and change its appearance, change its weight, change its legibility very, very easily. All right. And so, I think the biggest thing from this one, this is again Bill's portfolio, is looking at this photo, you immediately see a couple of things. One, you, you see that he has an ability to tell a story through a photo. It's quiet, but there's a certain professionalism in that photo. On top of that, you know, the detailing that happens, the way the depth of field works, the, 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 the way the soldered points are, the kind of the orientation, it would, uh, our graduate director would be really happy about the fact that the verticals are truly vertical. Um, all those little elements, immediately give us a sense of the type of designer he is. Like for example, this does not feel like a person who's going to be sloppy all over the place and missing deadlines. This feels like someone who, who will sit there and correct all their pens on their page to make sure that everything is perfectly lined up. All right. So real quick, before I have to run to a lecture, on, ironically enough, on portfolio design for my class, uh, photographing models. You know, we say this in studio all the time. Don't wait until after the semester to photograph. And as you saw with some of the images we already looked at, um, include process models. But process models should not be photographed like they're process models. They should be still be photographed in a way that is compelling, that is beautiful, that is professional. So we do have the setup over in the next room that you can do this. This is a multi-thousand dollar setup. So if you guys have access to it, by all means, that's awesome. But you can get away with, I think in our 3D class now, we've gotten it down to like $9 for how you can get professional looking photos with just, if you understand the principles of the cyclorama, so meaning the curved background, gives you an infinity edge, so it looks like the background's disappearing forever. Uh, using images, try, unless you're doing a light study, don't include direct lighting on your shots. Do indirect, so it's looking about the object. If you're gonna have shadows and those things, you need to really be clear on why you're doing that. 
here's kind of a couple of examples of people trying to kind of jerigging their, their own solutions of how to show a photograph. So um, for the battery pack, basically they're just using vellum or trace around a reflective object. Notice that we s we'll see this line over here. So this is an ideal because you're going you're gonna to see that hard edge. And if you need to Photoshop something out, it's going to be really hard. If you need to comp it into something else, don't shoot it on a, on a similar background. Shoot it on something like green or blue where it's easy for Photoshop or if you're doing motion graphics, After Effects, to rotoscope it out so you can do a color selection. Yeah. You don't even have to buy lights. If you have a beautiful light, any guesses where is the light coming from in this one? The window, but what direction? North, yeah, northern light. Southern light, not a happy time because southern light, you're going to get direct light, and that's not ideal. You get a beautiful northern light. If you're in New York City, you will pay $10,000 for a studio that has a photo studio that has a beautiful northern light that, that brings it in because you're going to get a nice kind of even glow to all your images. Um, so even process models. I mean, there's, there's a little wackiness that's happening in the background, but luckily there's enough stuff that's happening in the foreground that you probably didn't notice right away what's going on. I'm not even sure what this is, truthfully. This might be plus acrylic, but this could also be just someone's finger in the photo. You never know, but it works in the shot, so sometimes it works. Um, it's okay to put your hands in there, so this is showing kind of the transform transformative abilities of something over an object. Uh, and then if you're going to show the same object transforming or if you're going to show variations of the same one, a grid is great because in architecture school and as architects, we love typologies. So we love seeing the variations within the same. All right. Made it with 90 seconds to spare. All right, so it might be the fastest I've ever talked. Um, you want to jump in? Uh-oh, uh you're dragging me behind. Yeah. Uh, in the last session, we also mentioned, in addition to portfolios, you would have a sample worksheet, <coughs> which is the introductory part of your work that you would combine with a resume and a cover letter. So we just put together some samples of um, Tina Zheng. She recently, in the past two weeks, secured four interviews. She also worked uh, with Mary Scott in the last um, semester, creating her portfolio book. So separate from the portfolio book, which includes a lot of your projects, the sample sheet is a one page, and it may be a combination of um, probably no more than five or six pages of your projects. But it's a teaser, meaning that this is what your employer would see when they ask you for sample work. So what she did is using also the concept of white space that we had talked about, and this is in a single page format for each project no less than five uh, megabytes, which is um, some of the criteria that Doron even mentioned earlier, two to five. Uh, Tina just took the essential drawings that illustrate an ability. So for example, in this underground library, she, real, she included the perspective along with the plan. And so you may look at the plan and say, oh, you know, it, it seems to be normative. But then when you realize that her perspective views, both her drawings illustrate that she, this library idea is actually underground with um, slices <coughs> of light cutting into the landscape. And then she also included a section detail um, as a way to show an idea that she understands its kind of uh, quality of light and, and section capacity uh, ability. This other piece, is really to illustrate um, the conceptual idea that is a part of her thesis. Uh, it's in a larger site that is a museum cultural center. And I'm actually not sure why the Jim Ming Tina Chen was double. Yeah, I think that might have been in the, um, well, there's double images. It's probably in the Photoshop. That's probably what happened when, when we brought it in. Uh, but, she, but this page is actually three images, meaning the perspective drawing, a section, and then her site plan idea to uh, give the prospective employer a sense of um, what the project is about. And then we can just ignore the double texting, the double text that you see up above. That's probably my technical area to bring it in. Uh, and then another page, which is the swimming pool project, what she did is she illustrated the site plan so you understand the context. It's a hint of the floor plan. 
and then again a render perspective and a develop elevation uh, plus a drawing detail. Uh, this is an example of a student that is seeking work in a project where they um, asked for an intern, but they wanted that intern to be able to spend the spectrum of assisting in design drawings as much as technical drawings. And so she purposefully combined some of the section drawings and details just to illustrate, well, I have this ability. I may not be able to develop all of this on my own, but I can work with someone that can guide me. Okay, so that, and these are just those sound bites that you would send in with your cover letter and your resume. So we start with the search when you look um, to see who would you like to work for and apply as an intern. And when you go to the website, and Karen, just feel free to pitch in on this as well. Um, Stephen Hull is probably a favorite of many of us, but when you look at the website, uh, Daron mentioned earlier, you would be applying to the office because a particular venue of their portfolio is something you're interested in. So for example, Stephen Hall has uh, not only projects that are recent in construction, he has religious works, that beautiful chapel that we all know about in Seattle, museums, there's housing, there's beautiful furniture design. And then you would look at the criteria for sending your work in and the requests below which um, invites you to submit would be a resume and a portfolio two megabytes or smaller, right? So that's, this is why you need to think ahead a little bit about what work you would choose and the resolution and then selectively submit the best part of you. Last week, we used a word that was uh, representative of who you are when you show your work. I don't know if anybody remembers what that word is. The profile of who you are um, and the way that you would project yourself in a portfolio or in a work sample. It's that word branding. Uh, and so when you submit the two megabyte uh, work sample, you would make sure then that that whole idea is transparent and continues through. Uh, so you can also look at um, there's a submittal who to submit to, so it's actually the managing associate, it's not Mr. Hull himself, right? And you would pay attention to um, that submittal plus the exhibition, plus the um, two megabyte size. And so you're actually sending it to someone specific in that office. Woods Bag Baguette, which is a local firm, they're very much, uh, they have a very structured internship program, which a lot of our students uh, are actually currently applying. Their deadline was just like within the last week or so. So I know all of you are sending in your work. Uh, what I did learn too, um, Karen and I know different individuals in the office, but even if, it, even if there was a deadline that was just last week, still be persistent and send in your work. Um, because what happens is sometimes they're not always looking at it right away, but they're collecting and as they're collecting, uh, it may give you that opportunity. But of course, always meet a deadline. So Woods Baguette, um, it, it says March 24th. Actually, I think this was last, oh yeah, this was last year, because this year, is, it was just last week. So you, I would encourage all of you to still continue to apply. So one thing that's important, one page explaining your goals and expectations for summer internship. That's a part of your cover letter. Uh, which we had discussed last week about how to, how to pitch your work and how do you connect your thinking and your goals to the goals of this office. Your resume and then the work samples. And that's why we show these sample sheets so you would see that there's a difference between the sample sheet and then the portfolio that comes once you're successful upon an interview. And it says also to send it to Ryan Dotley. It's actually the same person this year. Um, and in your subject part, uh, you would write the 2017 or the 2018 summer internship. They also want to know that you're following the directions that are, that are indicated so that it makes their work a lot more seamless as they view uh, your submittal. And of course, by all means, um, you would 
look at their website and look at the different projects that they, uh, so that's actually a very general, because uh, I know that like um, Urban Systems and Brand Studio, there's actually a much more tighter sub subcategory of all their work projects. They happen to be a firm that works globally and many different uh, building types. Uh, so in many ways, what we teach here, you have a really good opportunity to submit your work. Oh, and then uh, we, we, I just highlighted this. Uh, one thing to remember, um, it says energetic intern designers that are excited to contribute to our next generation global studio practice. That's a key word in their descriptor. Look up what they mean by the global studio practice. Interns must be proficient in current digital design tools, uh, Adobe Suite, AutoCAD, Rhino, working knowledge of Revit. Um, and we described last week that, yes, you would include your skills, but the most important thing, what, were, what, were, what are some key important things to first state in your cover letter? And that you would highlight in, your, in the way that you may create your work sample and your portfolio. As a person or a work product? Excuse me? As a person or like for your work? Well, you, you are your work, right, as you're representing in the portfolio or work sample. But I think there was a, a couple of key words that have to do with the way that you think, mm -hmm. right? It's your critical thinking and the process, right? So we're encouraging all of you the final results are great, but all these employees want to know how you think. And we would further keep emphasizing that because these computer skills, they're good. You're all expected to have it, right? And so the thing that makes you unique, which we keep emphasizing, is what is your ability to contribute in the office in a dialogue? And it's really the power of your thinking. Oh, maybe Karen can pitch in on the SOM. Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is a great one. This is a great office. Yeah. yeah go ahead. I mean, um, so this is another, so the, what we are, so these are a series of examples where we we're simply trying to highlight that the requirements vary, right? Mm -hmm. So office to office, um, the megabyte uh, maximum varies, um, number of pages vary, what they want varies. So it's really important that you tailor, you make sure that you're hitting that basic minimum requirement. Um, because I think in, you saw in the Woods bag at the earlier slide that you know they actually specifically say, so all materials listed above must be, must be submitted to be considered, meaning you know, it's a, it's a really easy way for the hiring manager to, you know, reduce the pile. Well, this one, um, they, they, we want our interns to be able to follow, at a minimum, basic directions. And if they aren't able to follow this direction, then we're not even going to look at it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so go to each firm, do your research, look for this page, and find out what the, what the, how the requirements vary. Um, so firms like SOM and Woods Bagot, you know, they tend to be um, larger firms, and so they have more resources dedicated towards their summer internship program. For a lot of them, it's their recruiting um, tool, meaning uh, so they invest. A l there's there's actually curriculum. There's people in charge. You know, they plan way in advance. So I don't know if you noticed the the deadlines tend to be um, in the spring, so well before the summer, well before the semester is out. Um, because they, um, in a way, not only are they offering, inviting students for a chance for internship, but, but they also then turn around and invite those interns, the graduates of those interns from the summer programs back as employees. So it's a, so recruiting, um, I think uh, most students don't realize this, but for recruiting is a huge expenditure for firms. It takes a lot of money, a lot of personnel, um, to try to staff, you know, have enough staff in the projects, in the, in the office to staff projects. And so internship for these kinds of global firms is um, kind of their most um, efficient and the mm -hmm. most surefire way of making sure that they're getting quality candidates because they're able to vet somebody through a short-term commitment to then invite them back for a longer term. Um, but so for some of the, um, and same with mm -hmm. Yensler, another global firm, Mm -hmm. um, again, they actually specify a uh, number of projects that they want to see. Mm -hmm. um, and in bold, it says 
it's hard to see in there, but so it's in bold, only online application with work samples will be accepted, which is what Doran was alluding to earlier, but they're being very, very specific. So again, they list um, the requirements, um, you know, the kinds of software skills that they're looking for. Um, for something like this in your portfolio, uh, you know, and these are common software, so all, you know, most students would have some kind of examples of this. And so the idea is not so much to, um, you know, you don't have to <laughs> go that far to, uh, um, you know, add these as captions in your portfolio, but just be ready to talk about it. And so you may, it may be in the form of, you know, you're going through your portfolio and, and the person who's interviewing you just wants to make, wants to make sure, like, did you actually do this work and did you actually, ha you know, learn um, a workflow method through it? So they might ask you a, qu a few questions about workflow mm -hmm. that is independent of the actual design content. So just be ready to talk about it. Um, and so now we're headed into the actual portfolio itself, right? So you know who you're sending it to, your audience, you've checked the requirements. Um, so now we're looking at the portfolio. Um, and so we talked a lot, Doran talked a lot about, you know, um, how important it is to edit. It's also important to understand, again, because the audience is not somebody who is going to be familiar with the course numbers or the course names. Um, to use table of contents as an editing tool. So I'm going to go to this slide. So this is um, an AAU undergrad student, and this was their table of contents for their portfolio. And he, um, what I like about this is that he came up with his own titles, right? So these are, so if we go to this view, so we all recognize the course numbers, right? So mm -hmm. it's 310, all these things, they only mean something to us, but they're meaningless to an external audience. So he, he um, it was right of them to not even include it, right? Mm -hmm. It's just clutter. But he did um, think about how these projects are very different. Um, and he gave, he came up with, uh, so on, for example, um, th his um, ARH310 project, he put it under experimentation. And the, the pieces of work that he chose to include in his portfolio supports that. Whereas uh, some of the other studios he put under what he called buildable designs. Right? So this is a really great way um, to not only help you yourself streamline and edit and to um, figure out what to feature in each of those projects, um, but also to show the audience that you know, you're not just being led through the process, taking one required course after another, but you're um, at the end of this process, at the, you know, as you put your portfolio together, you're reflecting back and, and ac being actively, being an active, um, uh, be more active in, in what you take away from each of these courses. So here's another example. This is another product that came out of Mary Scott's um, portfolio class. Um, so here's a table of contents. And in this one, she simply um, gave uh, a very short uh, and uh, concise titles. Um, so Long Bridge, I Look Up, Passing Time, titles for each of the projects. But if we overlay the, studio, the course numbers that we are familiar with, this is how it, um, how it matches. And in this case, it so happened that it was um, reverse chronological. So the last thing he did as the, as the fourth year student being the first um, project in the portfolio. Um, but sometimes that can vary. So in, in this earlier example, because of that experimentation and buildable categories, um, you know, the, the sorting is different, right? So it really depends on how you present uh, your work. Um, so visual clutter. So so in, when it comes to portfolio, I think, you know, and I can speak to this based on personal experience, I think the, the, mo the biggest difficulty is that you have a semester's worth of work, you know, 15 weeks for us, um, you, so you have a lot of material. And now, you know, we've seen earlier in the requirements, you have to, you know, narrow it down at best one spread, maybe even one page, right? Um, uh, so in, it, this, is, this is not, only, it doesn't only apply to work samples. So even in your, in your portfolio, because again, you will lose your audience. If you go into too much into detail and, and cram your pages with tiny images, you will lose your audience. Um, and so that editing is really, I think, the diffic you know, difficult. So I think uh, as a shortcut or as at least as a, as a beginning point, we tend to you know, dump everything into your, you know, in the margins of your design files or you shrink your final review boards um, and see how that fits. So don't do that. Um, because at the, so this is a new, um, this isn't a re-representation of something you did before. It's a new size, it's a new format, different audience. You have to 
we, we uh, establish a new hierarchy, right? So visual clutter is something that is really easy to do when you're trying to condense something um, you know, from a large quantity of material into something that is much more streamlined and has a hierarchy. Um, and and it doesn't, it's not something that happens in the first go round. You have to do it iteratively because you have to decide you know, which of the content is essential, which is supportive, which is, I always liked this drawing, but in the way that I'm rehearsing how I present this project, I'm noticing that I don't need it, right? So it's a, it's, it happens through an iterative process. Um, so software actually, so software, um, it can vary. Um, so it'll be one of the Adobe Suite products. Um, if it is a multi-page document, um, InDesign is really the way to go. Um, Illustrator is appropriate if it's a one-off board. Um, so let's say you don't have your portfolio and design file set up yet and you need to you know, fire off a quick work sample. Illustrator is fine um, because it allows you to draw and type. But if eventually for a multi-page document, um, you want to start the, the file as an InDesign file because it's, it's a lot, it, that's what it's made for and it's a lot more efficient. And you know, Duran mentioned that you know, portfolios need to be customized and individualized to the audience, to the firms that you're sending to. That when what that means is that you're making changes, you're making revisions, right? And so if you have multi-page document, doing that through an illustrator is a nightmare. So you want to start um, in InDesign. Okay, so what not to do, don't clutter, don't, so, um, so we're talking about visually, don't list diagrams or, you know, renderings, <coughs> don't cramp, don't dump something that you laid out for, uh, for a different audience, don't reduce your final boards, right? So you're creating your work. Um, so Duran mentioned grid earlier when he was looking at the portfolio samples. Um, so it's really key, it's really critical because um, what becomes tricky is, uh, so on the one hand, you have large amount of information that you're trying to condense and each project is different. So your, your 210, your 310, your 350, all of the studio projects, you produce different kinds of work at different sizes that need to be shown differently. So if you don't have, if you, if you don't establish a grid that you use as a template, it becomes, um, it com becomes really time consuming because you're trying to reinvent a new layout for each project. And, and so don't do that because not only is it time consuming for you, it's also really disorienting for the audience, right? Um, use a template, be consistent, module from page to page. Um, so here's an example. Um, so these are actually final review boards. Um, but here's an, here are a few examples of how to establish visual hierarchy and sorting different kinds of information um, together. Um, so what we have are is, uh, so this particular use, student used this, the darker, the black background color. Um, to, and all her diagrams ended up there. So all of the final um, design plans and sections and site plans, they're b larger drawings, you know, with plenty of white space uh, within the the, uh, the white the white background. Um, and so even so, if you, if we kind of uh, if we squint and imagine this board without the the black background, it would be really cluttered because it's a lot of little drawings, kind of like in a way, you know, floating all in all kinds of places. But um, and that and I'm not sure. You know, so and so you know, so she didn't use a grid, right? So there isn't something that we our our eyes would naturally connect the dots and establish datum to visually organize on our own. So the the black background in this case really helped her. Um, and in this case, you know, it's a very simple um, stacking, right? Where the big images are on top, um, the diagrams that are in sequence in the middle, and then the bottom are supporting. Um, um, te some text, some image, um, you know, uh, plan detail, skin detail. So it's a very um, straightforward, layered, right? So you go from top to bottom. Um, and in something like this, it's more of tiled. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, so this was appropriate, especially because there's a, a, a vertically oriented rendering or horizontally oriented rendering. And then um, those smaller diagrams on the right, you know, you could assume, you could uh, orient them whichever way, horizontal or vertical. And so it's a matter of, um, again, using a, going back using a grid um, and choosing um, tiling 
uh, based on the, the proportions of each individual image, and then allowing the smaller, um, the, the vertical strip of the diagrams where you are working with smaller images, so be ready to, even if you presented it in a different, you know, s in, a, in a horizontal sequence for the first time you presented it, you have now the freedom to change the orientation based on the template that you're using. Um, so in something like this, um, so this is actually, I believe this were, these are two different spreads. So sometimes, you know, we, and in terms of the page size, so I highly, highly recommend using a standard size, use a letter size. So if you think about it, uh, a lot of the times, actually in all of the examples that we looked at, they are asking for PDF files. They're asking for it to be sent to them digitally. Um, they may, they may, so we have no control over how they will be viewed. They may be looking at, you know, a projector, a screen, somebody's phone, maybe they're going to print it out, letter size paper, who knows, we don't know. So assume the worst case scenario, so in this case, for me, that's the letter size, right? So that's the smallest and the most common printer that people have. And so, um, so pick that one because then it, uh, you know, it's something that um, doesn't get too small, doesn't get too reduced. And, and when you're laying out, um, you know, so it's a book format, so you're looking at the spread. So if each project is w two pages in a spread, make sure that when you send the work sample, the two-page view is one image. So in this example, um, this is the left side of the page, that's the right side of the page, but that's one image, one spread. And then the next image, again, is comprised of two sheets. Meaning, um, so otherwise, um, you know, again, because we do have no control over how their PDF will open, um, and they may not know that uh, the, it, uh, the pages are meant to be read in a spread, right? So, you know that, so again, so tiled, right? So there's a grid, um, there's a, a left, uh, you know, that has some background, like context information, some text, some study um, uh, precedent and study uh, models along the bottom. Mm -hmm with the next spread showing the final um, plans and models. Um, so it's a very clear and consistent format. And so, so something like this you would use for each project, right, over and over, instead of changing the grid size or, you know, what, what goes on the left column or the bottom, right, so consistency. Um, and then composition. So this is something, um, so because when we look at um, spreads like this, you know, you know, we are visual people, and even if we are aware of it or not, we take in a lot of information visually before we delve into each, you know, what the content actually is. And so it's helpful to look at um, how composition is handled in other disciplines, right? So in images like this, um, there's a very, very strong compositional element, which leads our eye into the painting. It divides the areas on the canvas. Um, the areas of dark and light, all of those give a hierarchy. So it kind of, all of those elements, so the diagonal, the road that cuts um, street, you know, the diagonal that um, leads our eye into the top part of the canvas. Uh, so our eye um, follows around those visual cues. And so in the way that you design your template and you set up your grid, um, you, should be, you should be mindful of that, right? Um, and also something like this that is, um, uh, much more flat, you know, it's, it's much more of a 2D composition, but there's a very clear zone, right? So there are something smaller um, pieces up in the top, and the bottom um, has larger images with, you know, perhaps, um, you know, additional detail in the middle, in the folds. And so when you're, when you're um, trying to decide, you know, where to put, you know, this one rendering or that diagram and whatnot, um, look at kind of the, the value, meaning the, the light and dark, um, uh, percentage of each of the images and try to place them so that there's an overall, in terms of the overall visual hierarchy, um, the, the way that the eye moves around is something that you want, right? So meaning uh, you want the viewer, the audience to start, you know, at this part of the page and then go directly to this image and then take in the rest of the detail. Um, similar. So white space, again, um, it's really, really bec uh, becomes really, it, white space is very powerful and it's difficult to, to uh, fight for. <laughs> so because we have a lot of quantity, again, that we're trying to condense, so the first thing that gets sacrificed is white space, right? So, you know, if we have all the space, we can, oh, yeah, I can put so many more diagrams or so many more drawings. Um, but, but that's the wrong, so in other words, um, you lose your audience. If you, if you pack and cram and list, 
um, it's really hard. Um, the density makes it really hard for the audience to take it in. Um, and so it's really powerful. So white space gives emphasis, right? Um, it tells us, right, so we go, our attention goes right to the black square in the middle. So those, the white letters on that black square really pops. Um, as opposed to if there was no white space or the black space um, was fill, filled the image or um, if, if there were other kind of visually cluttering information in the borders. Um, so, you know, white space, you, you want to think of it, I sometimes use the analogy, you know, it's real estate. Like assuming all real estate is really expensive, white, white space is real estate, right? And so you want to put, um, you know, put white space around things um, that are really important, like let's say in this case this image, or to separate, to um, establish zones and separate so that mm -hmm. the spread as a whole has hierarchy. There are images that are large and small, immersive images, you know, in this case model photographs that are taken at eye level that lead you into the page, but then you come back out into some white space and smaller images that explain in more detail in terms of diagrams, right? Um, so hi hierarchy, so white space is one of the most powerful ways to establish hierarchy. So if we cycle through a few examples, right, in something like this, there's a lot of information here. And um, so the, the first kind of, you know, visually, the first place I go to is, so this diagonal of the pier leads our eyes straight to the, the project um, that with the green roof. And then the coastline kind of extends our eyes out. Mm -hmm. And then we notice, okay, there's some, you know, concept diagrams along the, the top border where the image fades to white um, and then uh, in the um, where the water texture is you know we see additional site response diagrams that's a very common way to mix um, different scales of drawings where we use the white space and then the the, uh, the texture space of the much larger image to insert these smaller images um, Carlo just left but this is in an example of Carlos um, layout um, where he's you know, very skillfully using a balance of black and white. And so it's used for emphasis. Um, but black is sometimes used as a figure in the upper images on the rendering to call our attention to it. Again, you know, the, the contrast between, uh, contrast of the black figure against the white background is really powerful. So it's the first things we notice. But then in the, um, in the lower, uh, lower left corner, he's reversing, uh, inversing the black and white um, so that the, the smaller, the precedent analysis diagrams don't get lost and they don't float. And they, it's very clear that those are different, ki those are not his proposals, that's a very different kind of a drawing. Um, and then in terms of rhythm and pace, because you are working with uh, a multi-page document, you know, Duran spoke to how, you know, people start getting absorbed and they start flipping on, um, and it's, I mean, it's a, um, uh, you don't want, as they're doing that, as they're flipping through the pages very fast, you don't want them to gloss over, right? Or yet, you don't want that experience to be monotonous. So rhythm and pace speaks to um, how, um, so if you have spreads, so in this particular spread, two page spread, there's a lot of white space. One big image, big uh, font text, a lot of white space. And then it goes to, um, sm so big image and then smaller images with smaller text and then additional detail, right? So again, like you're slowing down, the pace is slower now. The person is kind of looking at, pausing at the smaller images, trying to read the legends, and then release, right? So a, a full, so a double spread, full bleed um, image that's an immersive image that takes you, um, you know, uh, an eye level image, and then back out to what, um, full bleed image, white space. So th there's a rhythm and a, and a flow so that it's not the same page after page so that there's buildup of small you know, density in terms of um, the kinds of drawings and information uh, um, uh, and, and the release that happens mm -hmm. with the white space or a full, uh, full bleed um, image. Um, so, you know, Duran mentioned, um, you know, critical, uh, uh, showing the process and, you know, Yim mentioned um, being, uh, making sure that you feature your critical thinking um, so, you know, pages like this are really helpful in our portfolio. Um, so this is the actual final project, right? So final drawings and models, um, sections, um, exploded exons, but there, it isn't, um, so in, in this particular uh, project, there's a lot of research, right, that 
that came that preceded the final final um, proposal um, that is con shown condensed and also it immediately leads to you know spatial consequences shown in a bar along the bottom um, and then here uh, her comparison the typology study of uh, something that you know, this person is critiquing with what they're proposing mm -hmm. so it makes for a much more compelling um, presentation of the project where we're not just looking at okay this person can draw this person can make a model this person knows how to make a detailed section but there is critical thinking and research that connects all of those decisions together so it's, it makes for a much more powerful um, presentation Publishing, um, so this is something that, um, again, uh, so we, I think in our days, you know, we all, all we had to do was to get it, get a book bound and, and then we were done. But nowadays, you guys have to be very versatile. Um, you're asked for PDFs, you're asked for maybe some other file formats, you're asked for, um, you know, printed books, but sometimes you're also, you're also going to publish online. Um, so here are some um, you know, online. So Lulu is something that all undergrad students, you know, would have been introduced to by Duran. Blurb is a similar service. Um, there are other um, other uh, businesses, you know, that that uh, offer online publishing. But Lulu and Blurb are some of the most common. Um, I'm sorry. So that that's where you put you. It's online publishing, so that you get a physical book back. Um, but I'm sure Lulu too, but especially in Blurb, when, once you load, uh, post your file for them to print, it can also live on their website similar to Issue or Behance, mm -hmm. uh, which, is a, which is, a, is a website that looks like this where um, a lot of, and actually it's a great place for uh, a lot of architecture students, undergrad and grad, um, post their portfolios here. So it's a really great uh, place to go to just to browse, go through different examples and see, and, you know, critique them and, you know, take good ideas, but, you know, leave behind bad ideas. So issue is one. Um, and this is what, so if you click on one of these, this is what it would look like. Um, right, so you, you advance through the pages um, going left to right. Um, and here are some examples. Um, so two of them are alums, undergrad alums. You know, one is not um, that you can look at. Uh, and this is what Behance looks like, um, mm -hmm. which is also very common. Um, business cards. Um, so for job interviews, you don't have to print business cards. In fact, um, you probably shouldn't not for the job job interview. But you may have you may be going to other events, you know, other networking events or um, within um, the AAU context, the spring show. For spring shows, you have to have a, if you are invited to uh, participate on the industry day, you have to have a business card. Um, and these are examples from uh, MOO, uh, M -O -O. Mm -hmm. um, it's fairly low cost, the quality is pretty good, um, so that's what we would recommend. Um, additional examples, so this is an AAU, um, this is actually do you, can you guess what project, what studio this came? Is this an AAU undergrad, yeah, 350 project? Um, so this is the how it's shown on on issue, and you know this is kind of their you know their their uh, decision, but so they they try to replicate, mimic you know the gutter with the yeah. the sheen of the glossy pages, and it's not something you can change, but you know it's how they choose to show it. Um, but these are, this is a, a, an undergrad student example um, of these spreads, right, for the uh, various projects. A 410 project, 450 project. Um, so in terms of best practices, um, so I can't emphasize file management backup enough. I mean, they, you know, every semester um, with varying degrees of, you know, um, sadness, you know, we mm. hear about students losing files. You know, it could be, it could be, uh, so the worst case scenario I think that's happened so far was a thesis student, um, as I believe this was maybe a month before her final review, uh, final final review of the mm. three, uh, 550. So she was targeted. So, you know, she did most of the things that we recommended, which is she had uh, an external hard drive. She had, you know, files on her laptop. Um, she w went. In, she went to a grocery store, so she put all of her stuff in the trunk, covered it with something, but she was being watched, to unbeknownst to her. So as soon as she went to, you know, um, go to the store, you know, somebody broke into a car and took everything. Took her external hard drive, took her laptop. She was left with nothing. 
um, so she somehow was able to cobble together because back then you know we submitted um, CDs da data CDs as part of the archive but it was devastating she she was devastated um, so don't let that happen to you so so Duran has a, a one two three tool hopefully all students who go through 250 are uh, familiar with this so it's, it isn't enough to have a thumb drive or an external hard drive you need a third place you need something on the cloud right um, and then the file management, um, you know, this is something where, you know, sometimes, in, I, mean, I don't know if this happens to you, but even um, a year after, you know, you, you go back to your, your work, you know, from a year ago, and you're trying to scratching your head, I, I can't remember which is the latest file or the file that I'm looking for, I can't remember how I named it. Um, you know, so, I mean, it takes a very simple, just come up with, you know, you've been saving files now enough for an enough number of years that, you probably have some preferences and some do's and don'ts of your own. Just develop it into a coherent system, right? Um, you know, um, using dates in the files is a really great way because it chronologically, even if the, the save dates get messed up because you're transferring files from external to something else or whatnot, um, is a good way for you to guess, you know, to the fastest way to, for you to find files. But fi come up with a file naming system, back it up in multiple places, including this, um, the cloud, and in terms of uh, featuring your process work, a lot of that process work happens as um, not digitally. So it happens, you know, through manual drawings that need to be then captured digitally. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, given the, you know, we talked, I think, in our first session about the demographics of the people who are seeing this, mm -hmm. which which tend to be older than, you know, older, you know, set of group than than you guys. Um, I can't stress enough how much. Um, uh, how many times the hand sketches or the, the quick hand uh, made study models get a response that you know people are delighted that you know it isn't just the glossy rendering that you know that is in the portfolio but there's a process there's a hand sketch there's a study model because it lets them uh, imagine again envision how you might you know if you're given a, a small uh, design assignment how you might go about and what that process might look like to the employer so it's it's so important. 